to see some new faces and familiar faces. So I had the privilege of introducing Dr. Marco Ruggiero. He was born in Firenze, Italy in 1956. There he graduated from the School of Medicine in 1980. He is a PhD in and a specialization in diagnostic radiology. He served in the Army as Lieutenant Medical Officer. From 1984 to 86, he worked at the, at the Laboratory of Cellular and Molecular Biology of Burroughs Bocome Company, where he published a paper sponsored by Nobel laureate Sir John Bain. He subsequently worked at the National Cancer Institute of the National Institute, Institute of Health of the USA in Bethesda, Maryland, where he performed research on oncogenes and signal transduction. He returned to Italy as professor of molecular biology at the University of Firenze until his retirement in 2014. In his 36 years of scientific career, he published more than 150 peer-reviewed articles and was invited to participate to hundreds of congresses and conferences. Currently, his main research interests are in the fields of oncology, neurosciences, and immunotherapy. Two recent peer-reviewed papers were co-authored by Dr. Jane Jeffrey Gretzky. He described the neurological alterations in the brain of autistic children and AIDS, KDA, and etiology of pathogenesis and autism for human beings in the course of 50 years. Together with his wife, Dr. Stefania Puccini, who is also a medical doctor and PhD, she is the event, able to be the inventor of the probiotic yogurt Bravo and the powerful tumor abating system based on natural therapy after the word doctor. <laughs> That's quite a resume. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Marco Ruggiero. Thank you, Andy. And I thank you all for being here. And I wish to thank the organizers for having invited us to this wonderful event. Okay, so uh, I am the co-inventor of this Bravo probiotic yogurt that you can taste if you wish, it is down there. So I have to declare my conflict of interest before I begin. And in addition to the Bravo yogurt, uh, and I hold shares in the Swiss company producing it, uh, I also am the inventor of a macrophage activating factor that goes uh, above and beyond the old GCMF that is called RERO. Also, it is very important before we start uh, to make a disclaimer that none of the information that will be provided today has to be interpreted or construed as a medical advice. Uh, these are scientific and academic considerations. And also, it's important to notice that some of the results that will be reported today have been obtained in different countries in the world where different laws and regulations apply. So if you decide to take inspiration from what I'm saying, please always be sure that you are compliant with the laws and regulations of your state or your country. This having been said, I am a little bit sad to report that this presentation actually has a long story because we began working on the topics that I shall be describing together with my very good friend, Dr. Jeff Brestreet, many years ago when we first met in 2012. And this presentation that I'm about to show you was born, at least the ideas were born, at the Autism One conference in Chicago in May of 2015, when both Jeff and myself presented our results and our joint results. In those days, uh, in his last public presentation, Jeff, you can still find this presentation on YouTube, the presentation is entitled, How Close Are We to a Cure? So in the last minutes of his presentation, he mentions two topics that I will be exploring today. Essentially, if you go to a minute 50 more or less, he says, restore the gut ecosystem. Sort of an imperative. Do this, you have to do this. And also, he speaks briefly about ultrasounds. Talking about ultrasounds in diagnosis and in treatment. So, if you go to the official pages, whether you go to Wikipedia, where it is clearly defined that autism, we don't know which the cause of autism is. But of course, you shouldn't trust Wikipedia. 
Uh, so go to the NIH, uh, go to the NIH and you will find more or less the same information that we don't know why autism is on the rise in the past decades. And also we find a statement that it is, it is truly transient, there is no cure for autism, period. So uh, how close are we to a cure? Paraphrasing what Jeff was saying. Well, in medicine, if you wanted to cure a disease, first of all, you have to know the cause of that disease, and it is called etiology. So, uh, we don't know whether Jeff and myself uh, have been uh, helpful in uh, finding out what the cause of autism is, but definitely we have done something in the topic of pathogenesis. What does pathogenesis mean? You go to Wikipedia, you find out. It's the biological mechanism that leads to the disease state. And the term can also describe the origin and development of the disease. So today you will not have no revelation of what the cause of autism is, but you may learn something how the disease progresses. And how we can stop such a progression of reverse it. It was uh, in January of 20. applied to these areas of the brain that are the areas of the brain that control the way we speak, the way we learn and uh, the way we form memories and also the way we can listen to things and we can react to what we listen. And what did we find? First of all we found out that this technique gives as many information as MRI but of course it is not invasive it is harmless and it is much less expensive. And actually we had published a paper in 2013 describing all the brain structures that could be studied, from the meninges to the cortex, the gray matter, the white matter, and most important, the accumulation or the, or the absence of a fluid inside the brain. What uh, later on we learned is rather important. So these are pictures of uh, neurotypical children but then we went and examined children with autism, many times twins, so that we could have a good comparison. And we found out that in the brains, in the cortex of children with autism, we found lesions. Uh, we probably would need a little bit darker of a room to see them well, but trust my words. So here there is a sort of a black hole, black hole that corresponds to lack of connections. So the neurons, the cells of the brain, are not properly connected, and you can see this clearly well on an ultrasonography. And also we found out that there is an accumulation of fluid, of liquid, of liquor, as we say, inside the brain, in certain areas of the brain. And we found out that there is a linear correlation between the severity of the clinical symptoms, that can be evaluated with a number of different scales, and the severity of these lesions. In other words, the bigger the black hole were, or the more the black hole were, and the more severe the symptoms were. And also, the more fluid was accumulating in the brain, the more severe the symptoms, the clinical symptoms were. Now, we wrote in those days that increase in the liquid in the brain as potential links to inflammatory changes secondary to stagnation of the cerebral spinal fluid. So I wish that you point your attention to this word, stagnation. Like the cerebral fluid is not recirculating, it is stagnating. And when water stagnates, nothing good happens. In particular, we thought that inflammation or accumulation of toxic byproducts of metabolism and chemical messengers from inflammation could accumulate. This makes sense because if uh, some liquid is stagnating, you do not renew it, and so whatever toxin, whether endogenous or exogenous, heavy metals, toxic, remains there, it's not eliminated. 
But in 2014, we were missing an important piece of information because nobody, including ourselves, knew about the existence of something that had escaped the attention of medical doctors, anatomists for almost 2,000 years. The existence inside the brain of a lymphatic system, identical in principle to the lymphatic system that we have everywhere else in, the world, in our bodies. Now, this paper was published in July of 2015, and it describes the brain lymphatic system. It's rather complicated, but it is summarized very well in Scientific American as the brain's waste disposal system. So the lymphatic system of the brain is how the brain disposes of all, all catabolites, exhaust fumes, toxins, whatever. So the brain's waste disposal system. And here they say that it could be relevant in Alzheimer and of course other diseases. And the author of this paper says the discovery of a meningeal lymphatic system capable of carrying fluid, immune cells, and macromolecules from the central nervous system to the draining the cervical lymph nodes. So the question arises, where does the waste go from the brain? All the waste that is accumulated, physiologically because of metabolism, or pathologically because maybe there is an overload of chemicals or toxicants, who knows, or viruses. So where does all the waste go? Well, the waste goes into, oops, into these lymph nodes in our neck, exactly here and here, that can be very easily observed with ultrasonography. These ultrasound images were obtained by Dr. Didier Klingart, Dr. Christine Schaffer, about one week, one week ago, I was there, at the Sophia Health Institute in Seattle, and you can clearly see, or follow my pointer, this is a, an enlarged, engorged neck lymph node indicating that in this individual, the lymph, the drainage, does not go through because the lymph node is clogged and so the lymph remains there. It is stagnating. And you can very, very easily, it takes less than five minutes to do this exam. Now comes uh, the second paper that we published together with Jeff which elucidates the pathogenesis of autism. This was published after his death. Actually, he submitted this paper just a few days before his tragic death, and I took care of its publication in December of 2015. And also, this is published in a very important journal. As of today, it has received almost 16,000 views that I guarantee for a scientific paper, boring and complicated is a sort of a record. So it has been very well accepted by the mainstream medical scientific community. Now, in this paper, we put forward an hypothesis that explains those lesions in the brains of autistic children that we had observed one year before, those black holes. And essentially, we hypothesize that when there is inflammation or infection in the deep cervical nodes, because there is inflammation or infection in our knee, ear, nose, throat, mouth, then the system becomes clogged. And if the system it is clogged, the lymph cannot recirculate, and all bad things happen. First of all, the brain, it is in a closed cavity, the skull. So if liquid accumulates, of course the cells, they separate, and so you lose connections. But even worse thing may happen, because as we say here, uh, this led our attention to the pathogenetic potential of chronic infections leading to inflammation as subsequent deficit of lymphatic drainage. Again, a couple of slides uh, from Dr. Klinkart and, and uh, Christine from the Sophia Health Institute. This is a submandibular uh, salivary gland, those glands that are here that make saliva. And here you can see it is, well, I don't know if you can see, but uh, there is a uh, Believe my words, it is uh, so inhomogeneous because uh, this is inflamed, and this is a thyroid that it is inflamed. Now, this leads to engorgement of the deep cervical nodes, and the engorgement of the deep cervical nodes uh, leads to stagnation of the lymph. Have we been the first to observe such a correlation between infections uh, 
in the ear, nose, and throat, and all this, not at all. But unfortunately, this observation of 2002 by a doctor in uh, South 